Okay, let us uh, let us continue with this um, uh, last panel of the day. Uh, me again, sharing till five fifteen. Uh, we're supposed to finish. We have to finish at five fifteen. So we'll go straight away um, with uh, four uh, four papers, but four presentations on a, on a, on a subject that is quite large: challenges facing Europe. And we will have Mirada Vahudova from North Carolina uh, Chapel Hill, uh, Maria Koinova Warwick University, uh, Jean-Francois Rattel, University of Ottawa, Mark Kramer, Harvard University, and last but not least, our discussant from University of Tartu, uh, Vyacheslav Morozov. So uh, let's start with uh, us in the order of, 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 uh, of the program, Mirada first, and please stick to 10 minutes and uh, five, please. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers. It's really been an incredible day of presentations. Uh, I'm going to pivot our discussion away from Russia. Um, the conference is about between the EU and Russia, so I'll do a little decolonizing here perhaps and shift the focus back uh, to this. Uh, outside of Russia, looking at particularly the challenge that Ukraine is giving to Europe. So what is Ukraine's challenge to Europe? And this challenge to Europe comes, of course, from Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, but it also comes from the way Ukraine has responded in terms of its citizens, its military, its government, its government at local, regional, and uh, national levels. And I see a lot of positive, potentially positive um, repercussions for the European Union, for Europe, for domestic contestation in European states. But I do that with two very big caveats. The first one is I could be wrong, meaning that my optimistic take might turn out to be wrong. And second, that these potentially positive repercussions for domestic contestation in European states and for the European Union are coming at an absolutely horrific cost to Ukraine itself. So I feel a little uncomfortable talking about the positive impact, for example, on German politics, when it's coming directly at the cost of tens of thousands of civilian casualties in Ukraine, cities reduced to rubble, and just immense human suffering. So maybe we can just take a moment to, to recall what is actually happening on the ground in Ukraine right now. And so I think I come at this with a sense of urgency because these changes that are happening in Europe are happening right now, yesterday, the day before. And these are, talent, these are changes that actually have the possibility of, of changing outcomes on the ground in Ukraine and either saving lives or not saving lives. So the urgency is, is immense. Um, so with these two caveats, I have four, four areas that I think are really fascinating. I start, I'll start with the long-term one, and that is EU enlargement. So this is kind of a wake-up call to the European Union, to, to large, powerful European states, uh, and a wake-up call about the threat of authoritarian rule, not just outside of the EU in Russia, but also within the EU. And so when you think about EU enlargement, the question is whether the EU can recapture this as a foreign policy tool that fights against authoritarianism, that promotes democracy, peace, and stability in Europe. Now, three things have happened. First, Ukraine is now a credible future candidate of the EU. It's not a candidate yet, but it's a credible future candidate. This is something Ukraine has been fighting for for decades, certainly since 2014. And so it is very good news that Ukraine is now through this terrible, this terrible way to become a credible future member of the EU. Uh, my colleagues, Oksana Chevelle and Maria Popova, who were also part of the FAIR network, have written really persuasively about how Ukraine is an excellent candidate for EU membership. And our speaker from Ukraine this morning, Uliana Movchan, also talked about this. In adopting and implementing the acquis communautaire, so much of it was about state capacity on the one hand and political will on the other. 
And if this war has shown us anything, it's that Ukraine has tremendous state capacity at the local, regional, and national level. And at the moment, Ukraine has incredible political will and unity. What can EU enlargement process do, potentially, can provide a kind of guardrails or blueprint or even just a helping hand in that transition from the war footing that we have today to the very technical, civic, and civilian enterprise of shoring up and strengthening liberal democracy while qualifying for EU membership and implementing the acquis. Um, one thing we learned from some of the best examples was, for example, Slovakia, is that what really matters in terms of the EU accession process working as a way to foster positive liberal democratic reforms is whether you have very strong bottom-up pressure. So it can't just be Brussels coming along with the acute communitaire and saying, do these things. You need domestic groups that are energized to use this process to implement domestic reform. And we have that in Ukraine. And what's fascinating, especially with Uyana's presentation this morning, you know, they've been pursuing many of these reforms without the carrot of EU membership. They've been pursuing them for their own uh, betterment of the liberal democracy. Um, from the EU point of view, the real challenge is to revive a sense of meritocracy in the EU enlargement process. So I know I'm not talking to a room full of EU enlargement specialists here, but let me tell you, back in the day, there was the impression, the general sense that progressing towards EU membership was a meritocratic process. And you weren't held, you weren't promoted for, for because there was a lot of politics involved, but generally you could say it was a meritocratic process. You weren't held back because a big EU member state didn't like you, for example. Um, that all went out the window. Today we have North Macedonia that has completely given up on joining the EU because that sense of any meritocracy is completely left. Uh, and so that needs to come back, and that was going to require political will on the part of the EU, um, and it's a real challenge, I think, to the EU going forward. The second thing, so EU enlargement, the second thing is political contestation in countries that are really at the heart of the European Union. So Germany stands out, of course, and Germany has for a long time presented itself as and thought of itself as safeguarding the heart and soul of liberal democracy in the European Union. Uh, but that has been the story that the Germans have been telling themselves and we've been generally believing. And this, this moment, this, this, the, the reaction of the German government to the war in Ukraine has really severely damaged Germany's image. And now we talk about Schroederization, which we've all been talking about for a long time, and now everybody knows about Schroederization, and now we have Schultzing around on top of Schroederization, and essentially we have both the center right and the center left that we thought, hey, this is great that we have a large country in Europe with a solid center right and center left party, but in fact both of them are deeply implicated in um, placating and profiting uh, from uh, economic relations with the Kremlin. Uh, there was an op-ed today by Nick Cohen who argued, you know, the cynicism of the Germans in dealing with Putin has been hard to bear, but especially hard to bear when it's accompanied by so much moralizing and so much corruption. Now, we see the, the moves that Germany's made, especially just in the last two days, and we think this may be a breakthrough. But actually, you know, we talked a lot about Russian society, but German society has a lot of work to do uh, in terms of really thinking through what it means to come to terms with the corruption and complacency. It's not just the energy deals vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. It's also the fact that the CDU and the European People's Party under the control of CDU politicians uh, essentially sheltered Viktor Orban's authoritarian regime from 2010 onwards and has essentially held its hand as it developed an authoritarian uh, country at the heart of the EU. Now, other countries are having really fascinating retooling as well. I mean, Bulgaria, for example, what a fun kind of way to think about Putin as the master strategist, right? You take a country that's incredibly pro-Russian or as pro-Russian as they come, 
and you essentially drive it into the arms of uh, the anti-war coalition within the space of days by cutting off Bulgarian gas and then lobbing a missile at Kiev while the Bulgarian prime minister is visiting. Uh, and so it's been fascinating to see Bulgaria move in the space of the last few days. The Czech Republic, also one of the most pro-Putin regimes uh, in Europe, uh, a president that's a Putin puppet, you know, within the last, since the elections in the fall, but now with this war moving resolutely against Russia, uh, including in public opinion. There's also political contestation. So my third point, in the countries that have, let me put it another way, uh, what about countries where we actually have democratic backsliding in attacks on democratic institutions, where ethno-populist regimes are in power? And these come in, I think, roughly two categories. Uh, the first category is the Law and Justice Party in Poland, but also Boris Johnson's revamped ethno-populist Tory party in the UK. They've essentially seized on the war, Russia's war against Ukraine to revamp their image as European statesmen. They've been invaluable in terms of military aid to Ukraine, which I honor and celebrate, uh, but they're also presenting themselves as being uh, leaders of, of, of Europe, but we don't want them as leaders of Europe, not in their current instantiation. You know, all the help that the law and justice party might give to, to Ukraine, which is amazing, doesn't change the fact that at home, this is an ethno-populist regime attacking the rule of law, dismantling an independent judiciary, incredible tax on uh, the LGBTQ community and women. Um, so illiberal, anti-pluralist, and ethno-populist. <laughs> The other group is doubling down on a pro-Kremlin position in Hungary and Serbia, although Serbia is complicated. And it's going to be really interesting to see where the cards fall. Like initially, we saw a lot of these far-right ethno-populist parties um, distancing themselves from the Kremlin, but not Hungary, right? And it's no, it's no surprise because in Hungary, we no longer have free and fair elections or a level playing field. So in a sense, we talked about how Russian public opinion doesn't matter so much. It doesn't matter so much in Hungary either. Um, okay, final point to keep my Melina happy. Oh, I know, my final point. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I'll just end that by saying this puts President Zelensky in a really interesting dilemma, right? He's always calling out Poland as a friend to Ukraine and calling out Orban's Hungary as, as a, an enemy. Uh, but in the end, like, what kind of an EU does Ukraine want to join? Uh, what are they fighting for? We often hear this, you know, Ukraine is fighting for European values. Well, that means a little bit more than, uh, you know, that is something that the European Union needs to fight for right now. And that's my last point, uh, that the European Union right now is at a crossroads. It has been at that crossroads for some years now where it needs to fight and fight hard for a European Union that is a union of liberal democratic states. Uh, it has in no small part because of the CEU and the EPP kind of been very complacent about this until we now have, you know, Orban's Hungary and authoritarian regime within the EU. And that matters profoundly because the EU, he wants to decouple the European Union from the regime type of liberal democracy. And that's just not a fight that the EU can outsource to the Ukrainian military. This is a fight that, that the EU has to do itself in terms of sanctioning and potentially suspending Hungary uh, in its current political form. Um, so let's see if, if they manage. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Oh, okay. So I think that my talk is um, kind of nicely following up uh, on what Noah was mentioning, but with uh, more special attention to Eastern Europe, especially in the Balkans. Uh, because initially when I started writing this uh, memo, it was the idea about how is it that we still look into the continent and we see because of the traveling around the flag, a lot of the movements about finding unity on a transatlantic relationship or unity among the Ukrainian people, unity among even the Balkan responses, which we haven't seen uh, in Eastern Europe or with regard to the refugee crisis. So, but uh, things evolved very quickly over the past 
places more I mentioned, especially with regard to Poland and Bulgaria and Russia starting to close the um, to stop the gas uh, uh, supplies. So, but for me, it's interesting to talk about both this polarization that we see in this part of the world uh, among certain parts of the society that could be the trojan horses of, of Russian politics, and how this relates also to the refugee crisis. Because I mean, until now we talk uh, nothing about about them, and I think that this really merits attention because more than 5 point billion uh, refugees, uh, Ukrainians, mostly women, uh, children, and elderly. Left. So there has been a lot of discussion about um, a pro-racial um, bias, about how European societies have responded, which I think uh, one way or another may really need a lot of reflection, especially with regards to how the Syrian refugee crisis or others have keep, I mean, there's a lot of people who are still trying to reach the shores of Europe by way of Afghanistan right now, and that is much more difficult for them. But one thing uh, that is being omitted is that uh, Ukraine had earlier an associate status so that uh, a lot of people had uh, visa free travel already in place. And uh, this does, did make the uh, launching of the European Commission's Temporary Protection Initiative uh, uh, directive uh, much more uh, quick uh, and uh, easy to implement. So, in that sense, I, I think that it's really important to look into Eastern Europe per se right now, because when we look into the previous um, uh, migration so-called crisis, right, 2015, these were Greece, uh, Spain, and Italy that were sheltering a lot of the Mediterranean migration. But now this is actually Eastern Europe that is having the shock. And uh, we have uh, a lot of countries, I mean, Poland is at the forefront of this, and we were having also conversation today with with um, Magdalena about the whole society being uh, engaged into uh, dealing with the uh, refugee crisis. But this is uh, also for Moldova, and this is also for Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, and others uh, uh, from, from that point. So um, in that sense, I think that there has been a very strong unity, and also the fact that Eastern European leaders actually went on foot, basically like by train, to, uh, to Ukraine that really mattered, and they've been there in the name of the European Council. And these were um, uh, the Czech uh, leaders, uh, Prime Minister Peter Fiala, Slovenian Prime Minister Janusz uh, Janza, and the Polish uh, uh, Morawiecki and Kaczynski. So, and what is important also to see in that kind of stepping up of Eastern Europe is uh, also the idea that uh, they're starting to uh, provide military aid. And many of these countries are already lined up. I mean, Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Croatia, Slovenia, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have started to do that. And even uh, Andrei Duda, president of Poland, said uh, what Ukraine really want, needs is weapons, weapons, and more weapons. So, I mean, this is not usually a discourse of Eastern Europe that has been uh, enlarging in the past, uh, uh, democratizing in the past. So, this is something new which we are seeing in the in the picture uh, of Europe um, in many ways. So um, uh, I see this basically as running on the flag because of a variety of reasons, like Russia's imperialist ambitions to be pushed back, solidarity with the uh, EU and NATO, but also there is a very big realization in that part of the world that if the war, war is not fought, fought now in Ukraine, uh, it, it, it may be very quickly fought on Eastern European soil. So they basically came in this, this way, pushing as a, um, uh, as a buffer, as a, in order to avoid themselves to be a buffer and the next buffer zone. But I mean, as Milana mentioned, the Victor Orban doesn't think in this way. Um, uh, he has, uh, I mean, Hungary has absorbed a lot of refugees. And that is interesting, this the dual, for, um, dual a politics which is between the providing of military aid and the refugee response. And here you could see the UK on the completely different side. It's like military response absolutely pouring, while the refugee response, even until today, there is some kind of like a home for Ukrainian refugees program that has been launched about a month and a half ago and is still dysfunctional. So, in a certain sense, this is like how do we show ourselves from the physical and the uh, and the Identity security of Europe. That's something also that Europe may need to 
So with regard to Orban, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, not only did he win elections in the Trump rating war, but he was also critical of Zelensky, and even he has been getting support uh, from, from Kremlin. I mean, we want to mention Bulgaria, I just wanted to say that in this part of the world, you may have a lot of, uh, um, even if, if nowadays, because Russia decides to pull the gas out of, uh, out of Bulgaria, it may have pushed Bulgaria in the right direction because the new government that came in the last year, uh, after a series of, of failed elections for a very long time, has been trying with this pro-Western orientation to actually push to continue this direction. But on the one side, we have in coalition partner, Bulgarian Socialist Party, which has been in kind of a good relationship with Kremlin even during the Cold War and probably never ceased to be in that, in from that place uh, ever since. And on the other side, it had a democratic, uh, Democratic Party, and both of them, both of them were constantly pulling in a different direction, and actually saying that we're going to destroy the coalition. So, in a certain way, it is interesting to see Bulgarian politics strong by Radar. And actually, the big question was, do we provide military aid? And the military aid, not the sheltering of the refugee, became that moment where you need to make a decision. And actually, I think that by way of the gas and the the gas that they call this uh, became possible. We can talk about this later as well. But I just wanted to uh, continue and say that um, I mean, Serbia is also a country where um, maybe you don't have this kind of like a divisions in the, in the same way that they're in Bulgaria because society is still very much reminiscent of the Kosovo bombing brought by way of NATO. And while you have in the whole Eastern European space, uh, more or less, the idea is like uh, we to repel uh, Russia's aggression and the memories of our Second World War, especially in, in Poland. And uh, I mean, even in Bulgaria nowadays, where everybody was considered to be, uh, the Russians were considered to be liberators, now you can come up with stories when they were actually not that liberating uh, at that time, but they were considered more like an invasive uh, um, a foot, uh, a, uh, military foot in the face. So the interesting thing is that uh, Serbia has uh, has been having a much more um, response, which is uh, um, divided, yes, but also much more pro-Putin in many ways, especially with regard to the media. So it's not so much the politicians, but in media and social media, you can see this uh, quite uh, quite uh, visible uh, because a lot of people are reminiscent of that kind of uh, bombardment. I mean, not simply, it's not a simple solution, it's much more complicated, uh, but uh, it's important to think that in, the, in those countries that are actually seeking uh, enlargement, we have not that many supporters of the European cause anyway. And even in Macedonia, in North Macedonia, we have, uh, we have a left party that has been quite uh, uh, opposed to that. And uh, um, I mean, there have been far right parties which were demonstrating in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Montenegro, uh, that were flirting with neo Nazism and uh, where somebody called them knowing not to engage in genocide and now and war in the case of war. So, um, my point uh, here is that these are complicated dynamics, and that uh, I mean, now we are in two months after the beginning of the war and still the onset of war, if we are studying like conflict dynamics, if we are still in the onset of war, then we're probably seen the process of some kind of settlement, uh, not in terms of peace, peace resolution, but in terms of like the ongoing war and all the parties that just for that. So, and while we're having this rallying around the flag, uh, 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 phenomenon that was mentioned a couple of times already in this uh, discussion, we may not, we may start thinking about what kind of processes need to be put in place in order for positive changes to happen, whether this is enlargement or whether this is what uh, I mean, I, I've been arguing that, you know, now refugees as when they are in Europe, they are supposedly in a good place, but empathy of uh, fatigue, fatigue of empathy is absolutely something that happens very quickly. We can see this in, in certain countries like Bulgaria, like <coughs> in three months, we are, you know, you start need to start paying rent, you need to start working, etc. So uh, these first signs are already visible in other places. 
I mean, we don't have to forget that Eastern European countries, I'm really sorry, I hope nobody gets really offended here, but I mean, they responded very badly to the, you know, to the Syrian crisis and anybody is coming from other parts of the world. So quite clearly and quite soon, we may start observing similar kind of like discrimination in politics. So as quickly as possible, one needs to put mechanisms so that this discrimination is much more easily um, easily countered <coughs> and there are mechanisms that are known to be so effective. So, but then this is on the personal level. So what happens, what we draw effects from the previous, uh, previous war, I'm finishing, previous wars from the Middle East and um, is that a lot of these, uh, First of all, we have a lot of polarization and a lot of parts of the society that are not exactly the least are having uh, a say that is uh, pro-Putin and uh, at least not uh, that much uh, rejecting uh, that attitude. I mean, um, uh, the question about whether to pay with rubles becomes also a very uh, salient political question. And how much money that would cost in order to get yourself out of the dependency of Russia may start triggering other dynamics within these societies because they are at the forefront of the, of the fight and they are not the richest ones, right? So how they, do they get their gas? How do they get their, their societies going under higher prices, etc.? That may trigger other dynamics which earlier crises were only on identity basis, which were triggering far right movements and a lot of uh, uh, illiberal, the illiberal processes within Europe. So, I mean, well, I mean, um, I may have been more kind of like on the optimistic side. I, I honestly do not think that uh, the longer the war goes, the more, the more the, that societies will not react in a bad way uh, or in a way that is not desirable for the larger European project. So, as uh, I think that the leader of the Belarusian opposition said, uh, it's really important to think that now it is the she felt she called it like a melting iron that is Europe, and with a really choices matter. So where the next choices are and how policy creates the gap would be really important in order to keep the European project on and liberalize itself. Because I'm afraid that more liberalism is coming to Europe as well. Thank you very much, Sean. This minute. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for the organizer uh, to invite me uh, to Air Network and Fun Art. Um, today I'm discussing about research results from a project that we have conducted with International Crisis Group with Raj, uh, <laughs> Russian uh, origin Muslims uh, migrants in Western Europe, in Ukraine and in Turkey, as well as Georgia. Today, I'll discuss more about Western Europe and Ukraine, but you can find all the reports of this research that was conducted for three years uh, with more than 100 interviews with uh, migrants, most likely North Caucasus people, but also people from um, people from other parts of Russia, um, all across uh, Eurasia. So when I first accepted to give and write this uh, brief, the idea was to discuss about the use and abuse of the Interpol system by the Russian state toward Russian uh, origin Muslim migrants in Western Europe. Um, obviously with the war in Ukraine, things changed a lot. So I will introduce a component about the war in Ukraine, how change, things didn't change. When we conducted our field work, um, it was in a period where there was a big decrease in asylum acceptance rates for Chechens, Dagestanis, and other Russian origin Muslims in uh, Western Europe. At the same time, it was a period where you had a flow of foreign fighters going to Syria, going to Turkey, going to Iraq, where there was a collaboration with between Russia and Western Europe about engaging in counterterrorism to identify foreign fighters and risk of people returning to uh, Eurasia and Western Europe through flows of refugees. So Russia instrumentalized and abused the idea of cooperation with Western Europe 
uh, by labeling a lot of Russian origin migrants in Europe as member of terrorist cells, foreign fighters, member of IS, and members of uh, insurgent groups in Russia. During the period after 2015, we've seen a growing cooperation between Russia and Western Europe uh, with those uh, Interpol Red Notices. As you know, Interpol Red Notices are not obligation of arrest warrant, but they are collaboration uh, between police forces with regard to people that are uh, under suspicion by the home state. Russia used uh, this idea in order to target people in an environment of securitization of Russian migrants. So we have seen between 2016 and 2021, uh, the extradition of several members of the Chechen diaspora, as well as Dagestanis back to Russia, even though some of them face risk of torture, uh, disappearance, and other human rights abuses. Um, under uh, the, re uh, the Red Notice system and Interpol, uh, people should not be deported to countries where uh, they have fled as refugees. Uh, obviously, when it is the case of uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or terrorism, the rules surrounding Interpol are more flexible. During the same period, uh, European country has started to deport uh, people looking uh, for asylum uh, in the European Union, most likely in the name of counterterrorism. Back in the days before 2014-15, before the Islamic State, it was something that was very uncommon for Chechens and North Caucasian to be deported back to Russia because they were not considered a state's third country for uh, migrants. At that point, with the terrorist uh, attacks, with the Brussels terrorist attack, with the Vienna one, as well as the terrorist attack in France against or the murder of Samuel Paty, more and more uh, European countries decided to deport uh, Russian origin Muslim migrants in the name of security, in the name of national security. Um, even though some of them face risk of torture, disappearance in obvious, obvious violation of international human rights. The argument was that Russia was a safe third party, even though Chechnya, Dagestan, or the region were not. So what we have seen is case of several individuals deported in the last two or three years, disappeared within the Russian system, were tortured, and were sent into a Kedirov prison after being deported from, um, from uh, the European Union. We have seen similar patterns, in fact, in Ukraine after, um, after the, the, the end of the war in 2015, or to at least the Minsk Accord. Several volunteers that fought along Ukraine were put also on red notice a list by Russia, requesting the deportation of several volunteers to Russia. In many cases, it was blocked by the European Court of Human Rights, but in one or two cases, people were deported from Ukraine to Russia, subsequently being tortured and disappeared within the system. A lot of uh, migrants from Russia, Russian origin migrants, were in a situation where they do, did not have any more travel documents because they were Russian citizens. They could not renew their documents to flee Ukraine. As well, they could not regulate their situation because of the lack of documents. So before the war in Ukraine, the most recent invasion of Russia, you had dozens of individuals that were living in constant fear of being targeted by Russia through the legal system or through assassination networks linked to the Kedarov network. Usually my presentation would end here uh, before uh, I would have given more details on the cases and what is happening. The war in Ukraine changed a lot because people, the volunteers, that were fighting in 2014 and 15 are back fighting Russia in Mariupol and Kyiv. But the problem is that uh, hundreds of individuals that have fled 
Russia, most likely from Chechnya, from Dagestan, and for religious repression that were hiding, undocumented in Ukraine, are now leaving Ukraine as refugees fleeing the war. When they accept the, the Union, the European Union, they face the situation there that often they are under Interpol Red Notice, that they don't have the proper document to be documented as refugees in Western Europe, where certain Western European countries tell them you should apply in Russia as a refugee if you're a refugee of war. Obviously, those individuals are people that have fled for several years the repressive regime in the North Caucasus. So they are stuck in a very awkward situation. Some countries like Romania and Germany are threatening to deport them back to Russia, even though they are facing risk of torture, a risk of extrajudicial killing or disappearance. In other words, um, as Ukraine was a situation for them where they were relatively away from the problem of the repressive Russian regime, they are entering in the exact same situation at mm -hmm. the very moment. Um, what does it lead in terms of policy recommendations? Certain European countries have asked for uh, terminating the collaboration with Russia with regard to the Interpol system. The United Kingdom, for example, has said if we cannot trust Russia, what, why would we work with them with the criminal system? It entails uh, a lot of problems because although the vast majority of Russian uh, origin migrants, Muslim migrants, are people that have fled the Kedera regime, fled the war, and that are perfectly illegal migrants uh, protected under uh, asylum or other form of protection of the 1951 convention. There are also existing jihadist network linked to the Russian origin migrants in Western Europe, in Turkey, and in Ukraine. Before the war, uh, with our research, but also with the journalists, and SVU uh, reports, we know that hundreds of individuals who fought in Syria uh, were hiding in Kiev, Odessa, and other region, uh, waiting for the storm to pass and waiting for a good opportunity to move somewhere else to take a break. Most of those individuals have not participated in the most uh, recent operation against Russia. Uh, the fatwa by Jihadist network about the Russian war in Ukraine is there are crusaders on both sides. You should not participate in the war. Meaning that in the fog of war, you have hundreds of individuals that are linked to jihadist networks that are whether uh, moving through the flow of uh, migrants that are the European Union or moving at least somewhere in Ukraine. What does it mean? That means that. It leaves the European Union and Western country in a strange situation. They do have to do their own due diligence to protect uh, proper uh, migrants and refugees that have left Russia for several years and left in Ukraine. <clears throat> At the same time, they need to document potential existing jihadist networks in Ukraine uh, and the Russian speaking networks without the collaboration of Russia or knowing very well that they are, they will abuse it the more uh, Interpol system in the upcoming year. Uh, this is a difficult situation. It requires at least the European Union to increase resources uh, toward Russian citizen and their application um, for refugees uh, coming from Ukraine and coming from the North Caucasus and other part of Russia. Second thing, it implies that uh, the European Union will ramp up their intelligence gathering operation in Ukraine, uh, in the North Caucasus, in Georgia, and Turkey to better identify existing networks. Uh, we have seen that uh, many migrants have used the flow of migrants between Belarus and Poland to reach uh, from Russia to the European Union after coming back uh, from uh, Russia. So perfect, thank you. Last thing, just a reminder, Russia, uh, as being recognized as a not safe third country for the LGBTQ community, but it has not been recognized by Western Europe countries or European countries as a not safe 
a country for Chechen, Dagestani, Salafi, the Qutari member, and other. Uh, it might be time with the war to review how we label Russia in terms of the 1951 Refugee Convention and treat Russian citizens as proper refugees of a repressive regime uh, and not create a dichotomy between Russian citizens and Ukrainians with regard to people fleeing the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Our last uh, panelist today, Mark Kramer. It, it, it was um, one slide that I wanted to show. If it's not here, it's not here. Um, okay, so they, uh, Magdalena gave me leeway just to comment quickly on the previous session. So let me just three quick things about that. One is um, with regard to the discussion among Sam and Henry, Sam and uh, and Masha um, is uh, I think one is I think about 2014 and 2022. Um, contextually, they were very different because in 2014, uh, the annexation of Crimea came just after Russia had successfully held the Winter Olympics, even though we now know that it was enormous cheating on the part of the Russian team there. But, um, but it had generated a very warm and supportive feeling um, in the wake of the Olympics that uh, was very different from 2022 when uh, there had been a pandemic that had uh, caused many problems for Russia, probably the highest death rate um, in the world, uh, even though it's not, uh, the official figures don't show that, but um, the excess death rates do. And, um, but also the, uh, that earlier, the, uh, around the time the mobilization was occurring as the Omicron variant was causing the greatest problems in Russia. So the, the sentiment, I think, in that respect, or the con contextual sentiment was very different between the two. And therefore, I would tend to side more with Henry on it. Um, with regard to uh, Irina's presentation, I, I just wanted her to say something about the rectors who did not sign the statement, because there were some. Um, and uh, one of the rationalizations for the rectors who did, the large majority of rectors who did, um, is that they would have been replaced if they hadn't signed it. But um, unless something has changed in the last few days, as far as I know, the rectors that did not sign have not been replaced. So um, that, again, it may be, they're mostly um, smaller universities in the North, for example, but, the, uh, but still, it, does lead me to wonder whether there was an opportunity on the part of rectors who may not have been so supportive of the war to have taken a, a stronger stance. On the, the last point is um, with regard to this, and this leads into my own presentation, is on uh, uh, Marat's presentation. I guess the, the reaction I have, and this also goes to some of the discussion on the Eurasia list service. What took so long um, for 
um, when Russia began supporting insurgents in South Ossetia and, and then in 1993 in Abkhazia, um, that uh, there was very little response or pushback to that. So I, I, again, I think the way the Soviet Union came apart and then, and then terms like near abroad were used uh, very um, widely by academics. I, I never used it, but, um, but uh, I, it surprises me that it's taken so long for this issue, maybe the, the war against Ukraine to bring it to the fore, but I just wish it had happened 30 years ago. So let me just say, I um, apologize for appearing here looking like I'm just about to go out running, which I will do after this uh, session. But the, um, but I actually did pack a coat and tie and shoes and other uh, and good pants and so forth to bring to this. But um, Delta lost my, I came from Prague here, and um, Delta lost my bag. So I'm, uh, and, and um, when I look at the status of the bag, you know, the bag right now, it says mishandled. That's all it says, um, which I, I could have, you know, told them without my having to look it up online. But um, so I'm speaking about something that uh, it, it brings it in um, the uh, at the end of the previous talk. I'm getting to. Uh, something I'm not going to be speaking really about Ukraine. I'm going to be speaking about Chechnya, which poses its own problems. Um, it has posed problems, obviously, going back to the very time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. It again goes to the question of post-colonialism, because Chechnya, among other, uh, among other areas, did seek to gain, it sought outright independence from Russia at the very end of the Soviet period, and Yeltsin sent troops there in November of 1991 in a way that didn't work out particularly well. But it already built in this notion of uh, that that there should be some at least questioning of the borders that existed in the Soviet Union because there were proposals during the early Soviet, very early Soviet period, to. Um, to have Chechnya set up outside Russia, um, that wasn't done. Um, but uh, the you know it's not to say though that it couldn't have been done. It's just that um, it was assumed that Chechnya should remain part of Russia because that's where the borders ended up on twenty uh, at the end of December nineteen ninety one. So the um, when first war began in nineteen ninety four. Uh, again, there was considerable support for the approach that Yeltsin took in, in launching that invasion, and um, that was not so much the case in uh, 1999, even though that war in some ways was um, more of a response to actions on the part of Chechens and others. Um, but uh, in any case, so I'm going to be looking at one specific instance of severe human rights problems in Chechnya. It's not the only one by any means. Chechnya for over the last uh, 15 years has been under the rule of Ramzan Kadyrov, and uh, we've heard a little about that now, but let me just say, I've been to Chechnya a fair number of times and um, can attest that uh, it is a place that even by the standards of the rest of Russia, um, just as appalling. Um, that, that is the, uh, the laws of the Russian Federation, the constitution of the Russian Federation, even though they are supposed to, uh, since 2011, they are supposed to apply to Chechnya, they don't. They're regularly violated by Ramzan Kadyrov, and there is no effort made to enforce um, those laws. So it, it, it really is an entity unto itself. And I, I um, in the past, have discussed in part why this is. But today, I'm going to be looking, um, or at least in the policy brief I wrote for here, looking at the persecution of gays in Chechnya. Um, I focus mostly here on gay men because um, the treatment of lesbians in Chechnya is appalling. But it's it's uh, because there is such a 
social taboo on lesbianism that um, there are very, very few uh, openly acknowledged lesbians in Chechnya. In fact, I, it's such a small number that uh, the major way that they have been mistreated by um, the Kadyrov regime is to sell them as sex slaves. It's not so much the kind of torture and murder that has occurred with gay men. The, the, um, the regime, I should add, is exploiting opportunistically, the Kadyrov regime is exploiting opportunistically the homophobia, the deep homophobia that exists in Chechnya. I mean, it exists all over Russia, but it's particularly intense in Chechnya, uh, where families will sometimes engage in honor killings. Um, in fact, in quite a few instances, they will. Um, they, or at least will shun and ostracize and, and disown their uh, relatives if they do come out as, as uh, gay. So the, um, it, it is something that has been conducive in some ways to the appalling campaign that has gone on over the last five years against gays to make Chechnya an intolerable place for gays and therefore to have it um, uh, is basically being the equivalent of what the Nazis envisaged to uh, gays, which was to get rid of them. So the, uh, the I discuss in here the there have been three major waves of repression against gay men in Chechnya, and uh, this whoops I guess he's no longer out there. Um, the the photo I was showing there, um, uh, it, it's not important. I mean I think most people saw before is um, that. Uh, the, the, this shows Kadyrov meeting with Putin. This was in May 2019, shortly after um, the second wave of repression. And it gives a sense of how seriously this issue is taken in the Kremlin, that it is simply a question, I think someone in uh, earlier in the previous panel, or maybe here, um, talked about basically keeping the issue off the agenda. And that's the way Putin has looked on Chechnya over the last 15 years when Kadyrov has been in power. He, de facto, he's been in power for 16 years, but officially for 15 years. And the um, it's, it's so long as he, it, uh, Putin is not having to face the prospect of sending Russian troops, Russian federal troops, back in to suppress an uprising in Chechnya, that's really all that matters. So he will give full leeway to, uh, to Kadyrov to rule as he wishes. And it's a relationship that has given Kadyrov considerable power um, because over time he has staked out Chechnya in a way that greatly diminishes federal control. In some ways he has achieved Joha Dudayev's goal of independence, but he's done it with while remaining loyal to Putin and ostensibly to Russia. But, um, but he has achieved such a significant degree of autonomy in Chechnya that you could almost look at it and wonder if uh, Dudayev were still alive today, what he would think of it. So the, um, but it's in an it's in extremely negative way. It's, it's uh, that um, as the campaign against gays indicates that Chechnya is ruled with extreme cruelty and brutality and fear. So they, um, I realize that I have already gone over my time, but, um, <laughs> but um, let me just say, uh, take two more minutes, is that the, um, the situation for gays now with uh, the waves of repression in 2017, 2019, 2021, that um, it, it indicates, uh, and again, why so many uh, have left and uh, many have moved abroad, but it's very difficult for them as Russian citizens to now to seek to move abroad at the very time that it seems to be more necessary. And this is where the invasion of 
Ukraine has created particular problems because of the breakdown of ties uh, between Russia and the West. Um, and it means that, for example, Russia was uh, ha has been pushed out of the uh, Council of Europe, um, which uh, it, you know is a measure I support because it is clearly it's clearly indicated it should be suspended from the Council of Europe. But at the same time, it means that Russia, as of September, will no longer be subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court on Human Rights, which already has ceased taking cases from Russia. And the vast majority of ECHR cases were from uh, the Russian Federation, and the majority of these pertain to Chechnya. So, the opportunities for those who are coming under persecution now in Chechnya to seek redress through that if, if all other measures fail in the Russian Federation, which they consistently have, that is no one has been held accountable, neither in Kadyrov's leadership nor in uh, the Chechen security forces for any of the uh, violent persecution against gays that there is no longer an opportunity for redress. So the final thing I will say is that um, as a result of that, the situation for gay men in the whole of Russia, but particularly in Chechnya, is perilous because if, uh, if this demonstration of a regime that's able to get away with appalling persecution without the slightest reprisal and again, lighthearted dismissal of it um, or denial that there are gays in Chechnya. And it, uh, I think, should be a cause for great concern. Um, it is a different concern from what is going on uh, with Russian troops in, in Ukraine, but it still should be one that I think many Western governments should worry about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now comments, Slava. Thank you, Makarana. Um, okay. Um, maybe because um, I started reading the papers uh, for this panel from um, uh, Jean Francois and uh, Marx papers, and only then uh, got to Milada and um, Maria's papers, I somehow found this this panel to be particularly gloomy and somber, even given the moment in, in which we find ourselves uh, today. Um, and uh, I feel there is a certain gradient of pessimism. If you go paper by paper, actually pessimism <laughs> is uh, And uh, Marx paper is, of course, the, the, the worst in that regard. Um, but um, I mean, on a more serious note, I think uh, the question that raises in the first place. And I mean, we are talking about issues between the EU and, and Russia, Europe and Russia and so on. And I would first focus it maybe on Europe. And my question would be also related to Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya address today. Uh, my question would be, is it really so that Europe is malleable at this moment? Is it really so soft? Can we really reshape it? I very much doubt that because I have a feeling that this sense of unity that we have today um, in relation to Europe and the West and kind of whatever uh, global uh, forces of good um, in many respects is very shallow. And it's about external threat, which is so overwhelming that of course it's, it's easy to get united around it, but then we get to real problems. And this is where we see polarization, we see lack of unity, we see conflict, and that is likely to become worse because the economic situation will deteriorate, uh, inflation will continue rising uh, because of the energy prices, because of um, the war effort itself, and, and, and then the need to rebuild uh, after hopefully the war is over. And um, um, in that sense, the question that I have to Milada maybe is whether indeed we should focus only on threats that are essentially external, such as Putin and Orban, or do you see the need to maybe look deeper and also think about uh, uh, think about uh, the depth of this unity that 
uh, you describe in your paper. And I mean, I agree with you, of course. It, 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 there is, there is, uh, it, it, this war has changed a lot in that sense. There are certain, um, you can say positive consequences for Europe, but how long lasting they're going to be. I, I, I in that respect, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Uh, and of course, I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, even though your paper is probably the most optimistic among the poor, it's still not optimistic at all. And then, <laughs> uh, then um, uh, to Maria, um, I think my my question would be just to 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 to, to cut it short. Uh, the main question is, um, you highlighted the, the racial bias, and this also relates to the discussion about uh, post-colonial approaches and the need to decolonize uh, our thinking about the region and so on. Uh, and this needs to be done, of course, in a broader context. You cannot decolonize the post-Soviet space without actually acknowledging also ra racial, global racial hierarchies of which we're all part. And this, this issue with it, com comparing Syria and, and Ukraine uh, is, is very much, uh, and, and illustrates this very, 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 very well. Uh, but can we really do it uh, at the moment? Uh, uh, without being accused of playing into Putin's hands. And if we can, then how? Or maybe we should wait, but we'll, won't we miss the precious time if we wait for that, for, for a good moment to come? So, I mean, that, I, I don't know. Uh, to Jean-Francois, to some extent, I mean, I had a question when I read your paper, which you partly answered already, but um, I, think, I think to you, I would, I would pose the classical question, what is to be done? Um, do you see any immediate remedy? Because um, I would feel that for the moment, any, any extradition into the Russian Federation must be suspended. And is there, is there any possibility for an emergency, for emergency measures to, to, to do that? And also, of course, uh, that brings back the old question whether we have not gone too far in simplifying procedures for suspected ter people suspected of engaging in terrorism and uh, extremism and so on, whether, whether we should maybe reconsider some of the uh, decisions that were taken in the previous decades uh, after 9-11 uh, in that regard. And finally, to Mark, I know you, you love a good challenge, so I will challenge you. Um, you started by asking the question, uh, why didn't we decolonize uh, the approach to, 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 to to the post-Soviet region and to Russia's relation, relations with its near abroad earlier. Why didn't we do it in the 90s? Well, I have an answer. Um, in your presentation, you, of course, inadvertently uh, reproduced the same paradigm. You talked about Chechnya in a very orientalist way, I would say. Uh, of course, I emphasize that it's probably not possible to do it that way. But this illustrates the seriousness of the problem that we're facing, because indeed it's a it's a it's a it's a terrible oppressive regime which obviously exploits certain cultural resources that it has at its at its, at its disposal, and of course this whole you know post-colonial or whatever the, the, the former colonized or the, the the presently colonized they are not necessarily you know. They, 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 they are sometimes oppressors themselves. That's, that's, you know, these hierarchies very easily get inverted. When you have a weaker party, uh, even if you're weak in relation to someone who oppresses you from above, you can still be an oppressor in a different social situation. And I think that, yeah, well, yes, of course, it's Foucault. But also, uh, men, uh, speaking of Foucault, and that's the last point I will make, uh, all these forces, of course, including academic discourse, are productive social. Right, so when we say something, we produce, we, we produce and reproduce hierarchies. And I think we should be aware of that. And I mean, I'm not, it, it's not meant to criticize you. It's, it's actually meant to challenge you intellectually to think about this and then in your next remark, tell me how to avoid reproducing colonial hierarchies when we talk about situations like the one in Chechnya. Thank you. Thank you, Stava, for, for short and very concrete questions so maybe we will start by by having answers to those questions if possible yeah. or, and then we will open the floor so prepare yourself <laughs> <laughs> all right I'll, I'll, should i start or you want to reverse 
I think you. Okay. Just all right. Um, well, can Europe be reshaped? Um, I certainly think this is a great question. That this unity of the moment is about external threat, and you know, NATO might be very united, but it's also pretty useless in a sense. Like, or, or to put another way, NATO is going back to doing what it's done since it was formed. Collective Security Alliance, but that unity is especially helpful for liberal democracy in Europe and so forth. Um, I'm very skeptical, actually, in many ways, but I will say this, that three things. First of all, um, I think it's precisely looking inside of the European Union and inside domestic political contestation. That's where the answers are. It's not never, the answer is never at the EU level. By the time you get to the EU level, Decisions have already been made based on who's in government in critical EU member states. And so in this sense, Orban is on the inside and he is a huge problem. The Fidesz government and authoritarian government within the EU. And you know, there's no underemphasizing how much this is a result of the complicity of the CDU and the European People's Party, which essentially sheltered the Orban regime in order to be the most powerful bloc in the European Parliament. Um, I'm very skeptical about the Germans because essentially what, what the moment is calling for is for the Germans to reassess their own self-image as this country that has so beautifully and thoroughly dealt with its past and, and above all others come to terms with it, the Nazi crimes. Well, it may have done that, but in the process gave itself permission to essentially have these incredibly corrupt and destructive relations with Putin on top of sheltering Orban. Uh, and dealing with that is going to be, I think, very difficult. Um, that somehow German guilt vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union because of the horrors of World War II then meant that they should be complacent and, and somehow would change I've, I've been reading a lot about the internal debate in Germany right now, and a lot of the arguments, well, we thought that if we traded a lot with the Kremlin, we would somehow end up helping them become more democratic through trade. And that is like so 1990s. I mean, I didn't think anybody was a McDonald's on every corner. I remember that from 1991. Um, so I feel like that that contestation, we've, you know, I, I work with the Chapel Expert Survey where we look at placement of political parties and where are the axis of domestic competition. And what we see across the board is this move from domestic competition on the economic left-right axis to do with redistribution, you know, how much do you tax and spend, to basically competition on a cultural or identity axis where you have the progressive libertarian liberals block versus a traditional authoritarian nationalist block. And that competition on identity is complete in Hungary. That's the only kind of competition you have. There's virtually no competition on a traditional economic left, right? Uh, and so that is really worrying to the extent that all competition now comes down to this in many states. But I will say on a positive note, before the war started, you know, the Czech Republic did manage to vote out its ethno-populist regime that was trying to backslide. Uh, the Slovenian ethno-populist ruling party lost uh, last weekend or the weekend before, even though Prime Minister Jancsa had gotten on that train to go to Kiev with the uh, Polish and Czech leaders. Um, so in terms of this domestic contestation, I still think there's a lot of variation and a lot of areas where we're worried and a lot of Areas for hope as well. Thank you. Let's go to so, yeah. your side of this. Yeah, um, I think that um, I mean, I'll pick up on the question about whether Europe is marable, which was a question for Marcel because I think it, it kind of helps me answer my. I think it is marable. Maybe it's not as marable as it was suggested, that is, that kind of iron that really could be shaped in any form. But I think it is because decisions at the kind of critical junctures uh, to kind of invoke some of the literature we know, but they really matter, right? What makes the decisions of what kind of path you, you put uh, that? So it means that you, what I was suggesting, for example, as kind of policy recommendations, it means about very strong anti-discrimination mechanisms that are not existent in the migration back, that are mostly about the borders of Europe, but not what happens. Trans people are in 
So, I mean, enhance that kind of protection mechanism, something which could be done, basically, not by people who are fighting the war, but people who are committees of the of the of certain countries, of the European Union, of legislation that could be really passed. Because, I mean, the pandemic was used very clearly to, to pass the migration pact, right? So why not enhance also with regard to global compact on migration, also the protection mechanism? And why I'm saying this is exactly because of this colonization and documentation idea about the racial bias. Europe does have a racial bias towards uh, Ukrainians in terms of what is it that it is being emphasized? People look like us. They are having a common history as us. They have the same religion. Like, I mean, if you were in Europe and watching television during the times when the first, uh, the first um, uh, people were coming in, in Germany from Syria and coming now, similar response. But what happens right after that? Right? I mean, they were waiting on the stations with people trying to get them, etc. So also about certain Syrians was happening. But right after that, the whole society does not keep up to educate others about what is about their religion. I mean, now on Easter, for example, you can hear all people like being educated, are orthodox people. They wouldn't do this for Bulgarians or others. There's not a strategic response there. Media, for example, because you were saying what media can do, maybe you can stop saying they look like us. They are Christians, right? I mean, that's simple, very simple thing that media can do in order to reduce the racial bias. But what I was saying at the end of, of my presentation was that, you know, societies and Eastern European societies, per se, who have very big issues with diversity, but they haven't dealt with this historically very well, and not dealing with the quota system that the European Union imposed on them for the previous migration wave. Why would you expect them that they would behave really, really very good with towards the Ukrainians when it comes to the point of uh, seeing that Ukrainians are the, the Ukraine and the war is the one that asks anybody to pay 40% more for their for the electric bill? And I just don't try to, to avoid it to the, the point. So if Europe puts that racially, I mean, it's both racially responding towards Ukrainians as looking like us. But also the racialization of the response that will come because that will come in towards the first times up there towards the Ukrainian refugees themselves. So put actually to decolonize ourselves, to put understand that you know people react in these ways and that there's historical reasoning for that, and put mechanisms against discrimination, precarity, exploitation, and anything else that may be there. That is not that difficult to do. I mean, that needs political will, that needs political. Uh, engagement, right? At times, at what that may be very difficult to do, but it's not something that you would put. Uh, somebody was asked, I, I think that was, was asking whether this is something that you could say, putting money, uh, putting uh, water in the middle of of, uh, of Putin. It's not because it is about self reflection of Europe and putting mechanisms that could they rationalize, uh, they rationalize the, the response in double ways. First, we don't have to respond to people who look like us, they are our own religion. And second, if we react like this to them, let's put mechanisms to support them when the time comes, for time coming, and also impose these mechanisms for other refugees that are in the world. Satisfied? Satisfied? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. The question what can be done uh, with regard to deportation? European countries should not be deporting Chechens or other in Russia, simple like that. If they are risk to national security, they should be prosecuted as such within European countries. When we're talking about red notices and extradition, uh, with regard to crimes committed at the international level, it might be more tricky, but if it's about foreign fighting, uh, European countries have the same law that Russia has. So European countries should do their due diligence and prosecute at the European level. If we're talking about crimes committed within uh, Russia, um, in the case before 2015, like the case of Ahmed Shetayev, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has adopted a maximalist protection approach where even when there's doubts of involvement in terrorist network, the protection given by international human rights law should be given. Um, Again, that's a discussion that we can have. It's a bit more tricky with regard to crimes committed on Russian territory 
But I'll remind everyone something, one thing that the European countries can do, and even the United States is protecting uh, Russian origin Muslims in their country. Uh, when we're talking about the LGBTQ community, uh, the majority of uh, people that have left Chechnya are not approaching their own community and not saying they're Chechen or English because they might be killed in European country. Uh, there's several cases about that. There's several cases of abduction of people being returned to Chechnya to be tortured and killed. Uh, in terms of resisting Russia, if we're talking about civilian resistance, small things can be done at the European level that would make a huge difference for a persecuted community. Uh, for LGBTQ community from Chechnya and around, but as well as Russian origin Muslims that have left religious uh, persecution in Russia. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mark, you uh, okay. I, I, I will um, be very brief here. I, I know there have been several people who've said that and then have gone on for extensive <laughs> periods of time. But, the, uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in this case, I will be. I just, I find the um, situation now between the federal government in Russia and Chechen government to be, you know, as a scholar, to be an extremely interesting one in that it went over the last uh, 20, 28 uh, years or so from being one in which the local government was striving for independence and uh, failed to achieve it to one now in which the local government, that is the government of Chechnya, does have de facto independence. Um, it's not total independence because Kadira still depends on Putin's support. But if Putin were to decide, say, tomorrow that somehow he no longer wanted to have amiable meetings with Kadira and to get rid of him, it would be very hard to do that. Um, Kadyrov has been, you know, for all of his sadism and cruelty, he is an extremely savvy politician. And um, because he's such a, um, a primitive person in many ways, I find it very interesting that he has been so skilled in staking out Chechnya the way he has. So I don't think I would see it quite the way you do, Slava. I would... Um, see it more as a much more equal relationship between um, there and um, but what I what I um, still would come back to though is um, for persecuted uh, minorities in Chechnya and, and again I'm talking mostly about gay men because because as I mentioned with lesbians um, there's such a stigma to it that there are very few open lesbians there, there are more open gay men, but you know, most of them now have sought to leave uh, either to other parts of the Russian Federation or um, increasingly to go abroad, but it is very difficult for them to go abroad. So that, that's where I would very much agree um, you know, that there are certain small steps, that it's small but important steps European countries can take, but I don't really see much. Thank you very much. So we will open the floor for for questions. And uh, is there someone with the micro? No. Okay. We have. Uh, we will take three questions here, and then go to the other side of the. Uh... <laughs> yes. There are three. And please, 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 just um, short and sweet. Yeah, many thanks to all the speakers for your presentations. I would like to address my question to the first speaker, Professor Deva, um, and it's about Ukraine's membership uh, perspective in the EU. So as we know, Ukraine has been seeking this uh, membership for quite some time, for many years. Back in 2000s, for instance, during the negotiation of the EMP Action Plan or PCA. So looking back now, do you think it was a strategic mistake from the EU not to grant membership perspective to, to Ukraine back then and to send this stronger single signal of support to the Ukrainian population and, um, um, and leadership. Uh, because as we can see, it has not the EU's refusal has not prevented um, 
Russian aggression against you. My second question is, do you think that this um, membership perspective can become a sort of part of this quid pro quo package uh, for Ukraine to give up its, um, uh, its uh, membership aspirations in NATO? Uh, and finally, uh, how do you see the future of Eastern Partnership Program in, in, you know, in the wake of the recent developments like Belarus, for instance, left Eastern Partnership last year, Azerbaijan um, signed this uh, declaration on allied interaction with Russia just hours before the war. And Armenia, as we know, is, is very tightly linked to the Eurasian Economic Union. So how do you see visibility of this project. Thank you. Okay, this is a great, oh, am I on? Okay, it's very excellent questions. And um, the question is, is EU enlargement a project of security or a project of economic well-being and prosperity? Actually, the two are intertwined. But the EU has a very hard time prosecuting a foreign policy with domestic costs. And it was only in the after the terrible wars in the Western Balkans uh, that the EU kind of came to this idea that enlargement would be a form of foreign policy that would lead, that would be engaged, they would engage in that in terms of secure, you know, a security project as opposed to primarily an economic project. And so I think the thing with Ukraine is that it was viewed very much as letting Ukraine become a credible future EU member would be harmful to security because it would provoke Russia. So this old argument became what some people would say. And on the other hand, some of the economic benefits of close relations with Ukraine, the EU could have anyways. Um, but mostly it was really a question of, of member states not wanting to take the next step, not wanting to continue to pursue an enlargement project, which was getting more and more difficult, along with the Russia question. Was it a mistake? Yes, absolutely. Because now the EU is paying, and EU member states are paying a huge price for the war. Of course, Ukrainians are paying a much, much higher price, but this is not something that is, that, you know, this is what Europeans are supposed to be trying to prevent, which is a full-scale war on their borders. The argument for letting the Western Balkans into the EU has always been now a security over an economic argument. I think what bodes really well for Ukraine going forward is that Ukraine both offers tremendous economic opportunities and also a way to solve the security problem going forward. So yes, I think that it can be a quid pro quo in terms of uh, Ukraine walking away from NATO. But remember that joining the European Union ultimately is a technical bureaucratic project, and that's what it should be. So Ukraine can't skip over the part where it implements over 100,000 pages of the communautaire and goes through these incredibly boring negotiations. But in order for these negotiations to work, there has to be political will on both sides for them to reach the final destination. And that's the problem in the Western Balkans. There's no political will on the part of the EU to let these countries in, and the political will on the ground for them to enter is variable. So hopefully for Ukraine, you'll have a matching of political will that can create the scaffolding for this long, quite tedious institutional and, and um, uh, administrative project of qualifying to join the EU. As far as the future of the Eastern Partnership, I don't know except to say that the EU has not been good at leveraging relationships short of pre-accession pre and membership to, um, in terms of its own foreign policy. So I think in order to have a, a, a credible and constructive foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the region, it's going to have to rethink what that means for itself. And it's just not ready to do that. Like at this point, I feel like it's barely able to handle the very big security challenges vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And then, of course, the Western Balkans are a mess. Uh, so in my view, it should focus on trying to revive some kind of a real foreign policy and emotional policy towards the Western Balkans first. Okay. Could we take two questions at the same two, one and two, and then one, two, three? <laughs> yes. Am I on? Uh, OK. Zuzel Czerga from Queen's University, Canada. And thank you very much for this very impressive uh, 
<laughs> well, I, uh, I share the sentiment. I'm very worried about democracy and generally, but especially in our beloved frustrating region. And um, I wanted, I'd like to ask actually Milada, because I know that you've been following um, party dynamics across the region. And one of, one of the things that are obvious to all of us is that there is deep, deep political polarization everywhere, not only in our region, obviously, but also in France, for example. Established, long established parties are disappearing, losing appeal. Uh, if you look at, I know comparative democracy indices are not great, but if you still look at them occasionally, you see that the only ones in Central Europe that are still classified as consolidated democracies are small countries with tiny uh, populations, the three Baltic states, uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And from what Milada said, that, that there's a realignment from class-based socioeconomic positioning and interest representation to cultural ID, uh, identity based. It's, it's really interesting. So from that perspective, uh, from that perspective, Slovak, uh, Slovenia and Czech, the Czech Republic are not surprising. The three Baltic states are because they have large minorities. And um, anyway, so I'd like to just find out if you have, if you see anything that's a cause for for uh, optimism in the way, because democracy after all is about this kind of stuff, right? Some kind of established political organizations that are able to maintain, maintain some kind of middle. So it's not volatile. Can we go with to the next question? <laughs> and then we'll take um, more questions. Thank you. Um, Christina Carlos from Tartu University. I have a question to Maria. Um, regarding the, um, the argument that I actually slightly disagree that um, the refugee case with Ukrainians is an expression of uh, some sort of racism in Europe. I'm not arguing that Europe has no racism issue, but I'm not sure that this is the uh, case where we could argue this, because when we compare it to 2015 migrant crisis, we had not refugee crisis, we had migrant and refugee crisis, and 60% of arrivals in 2015 were male young male and and they were not clearly refugees they were mostly migrant cases and that's why the european union could not actually activate the um, temporary protection directive because it, it had to go through the procedure of, of selecting refugees from the whole crowd that was coming from there you couldn't automatically just give to everybody so what the european audiences saw was not really a refugee flow they saw mixed flows and it was very confusing uh, when the politicians argued that this is a refugee crisis, but they saw actually a migrant crisis. With the Ukraine, it's completely different. It's, it's women. It's 90% women with children. So it's much easier for the public to understand that this is a refugee crisis indeed. So I'm just questioning the question of the racism here. And the second thing is that um, Syrian war is, was a civil war which most of the European societies had no stake in. Uh, Eastern European countries today are very welcoming to the Ukrainian refugees for the one reason only, and this is the reason that this is our part in saving Ukraine and saving ourselves. Uh, so we know that we will be the next, so we have to do this part now. So there's a personal security issue there at stake that these countries are feeling that they do. And that's why the welcoming of the refugees is a completely different story from Ukraine compared to the Syrian ones, because the main argument was um, we need to sort it out there, not let them people in here. So because there was no personal security issue there. So my question to you is that should we not be more careful when we argue that, that this is a racism rather than it's actually a different different case compared to the 2015? Thank you. So maybe you could respond shortly and prepare yourself. <laughs> There was someone oh, okay. So, uh, okay, so thanks about this. Uh, I mean, um, I started the discussion that there is a line in which we need to think about that there is part of it, part of the response is considered to be a racial, right? I mean, if you go out and, and say these people look like us, they're indigenous like us, and these are the aspects when it comes to like discrimination that actually 
will be part of the discussion. And I also even, I mean, to kind of counter your, kind of put food in your argument, right? I said that it was easier for the Ukrainians to actually be in a position in the air because they already have visa free status, right? I mean, there are also people in the Western Balkan camp. So in a certain way, the political will was already there. So the fact that, you know, people, uh, I mean, there is very, the other thing is very questionable about whether um, if, I mean, why is it that male, males on the one side and females on the other uh, may need to be discriminated in human rights terms, right? I mean, that's in terms of how the people accept them in, in, in the different publics accept them, that's another issue. Because usually the idea about males coming from the Middle East was very, very much of an issue with regards to, I mean, many of some of them are kind of like engaged in, in some of what things you were talking about, like uh, any kind of uh, uh, scary uh, radicalizing activities, et cetera, women do not do that. I mean, if you look into literature and kind of a lot of that has been happening there, women do engage in radicalism. Right, and men are PG principal, right? So in the sense, the argument that these are women and these are men in human rights terms, I don't think that needs to matter, right? It does matter in how people are perceived, right? That's true. I mean, people are, women are perceived to be, to be, although somebody in the beginning starts for those that need protection, and that's true because these are kind of the most vulnerable populations, and that's very clear about this. But in terms of why is it that we think about them, our these populations differently, we may want to think this. And my point is that this is a complex issue about how Europe responds to the to the uh, to the Ukrainian refugees, and some of them has very kind of like racial implications, while others are about political will, preceding uh, circumstances, etc. So I mean, this is kind of a complexity in which uh, the the, the situation was also dealt with when we think about the Syrian crisis. Initially, that was an euphoria, then was like support, and then were people dying in the Mediterranean. Now it's the story of return. I mean, if you hear about what is going on about the Ukrainians, it says, oh, these are women, and they probably and the children, and they want to return. And this is the argument for them that they, they may not be staying in Europe. I mean, we will see that many of them will stay in Europe, even if, especially the, the, the war drags itself longer. Because this is what migration is that one and one after the other and say, shows that people who lose their houses, lose their, their infrastructure, I mean, they find a way to stay. So and my suggestion was actually to think about how to increase the protection mechanism for people inside the place, what actually you are doing as well. Right to have that scrutiny about not simply whether you're male or female, or you are Chechen or non Chechen or whatever, right? To be actually um, assessed on your own merits, but then you have that kind of protection mechanisms that are enhanced, or maybe better knowledge about them, etc. Because Europe has enough of protection mechanisms. It's just that few refugees know how to how to evolve it. Few people of that kind of vulnerability know how to evolve it. Few women may know. How they vote it as well as well as females. So that's my answer. I wanted also to say something with regards to I mean, earlier question, which was about the new members of the VF. And the final that's part, is, the final part is about uh, we keep on talking about Ukraine, and we need to talk about Ukraine in the context of the new enlargement project. Because any time you start talking about Ukraine now and European integration of Ukraine. Western Balkan countries, correct me if I'm wrong, because you are kind of observed that, are running against this. So you have like a lot of a lot of competition that is at the outskirts of Europe and say, why is that you know Ukrainians are now more entitled than we are? Right? And that is something that Brussels needs to solve within, right? It cannot be though because it's Ukraine and we are looking in Ukraine that this is gonna be solved in this way. Thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll be yes. sure. I'll very, very quickly, please. Yeah, yeah. And then so, we will take 
three other quick know. questions. No, 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 we don't. Uh, I will say quickly three, three important things. First of all, Ukraine still has a long road to go until it is in the position of some of the Western Balkan states. So, um, but I agree with you that it needs to be a return to meritocracy in the EU enlargement process. So if Ukraine by its merit leapfrogs over Serbia, which I think is very likely, then, then so be it. I, you know, I study ethnopopulism. Um, Mar uh, Marlene Laurel's illiberalism, we've, we've both worked on this issue and a lot of what that is, is it's, it's top down. And so when it comes to the Ukrainian, comparing Ukrainian refugees and, and the 2000 refugee crisis, I think it's really important not to discount how much racism there is in all European countries, but to be aware how much the narrative of what the 2015 refugee crisis represented was captured by these ethnopopulists who controlled the media and who pumped out an endless vitriol, particularly Orban, but also in the Czech Republic and Poland and other countries, telling the voters that these refugees were an existential insecurity threat to them. And so people, people believed that, they saw the pictures and so forth. I think it's wonderful <laughs> that the Ukrainian refugees are not being portrayed in this way. Uh, and that is part of the answer. My worry is actually the opposite of yours, is that many countries will find it very convenient to have a large number of Ukrainians and they will want them to stay as opposed to um, trying to push them out. Um, in terms of, of Zhuzha's question, um, I do have some positive thoughts. I mean, I think the, the, the ethnopopulism is so powerful because it combines this othering of cultural harmful groups with a kind of chauvinistic economic welfare policy, right? More state support for people like us, for our people. And that is a very potent combination, right? We're going to protect you from the others and we're going to give you more social goods that we're not going to give to the others. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they're so potent. Um, but the causes of optimism, a couple of things. One, ethnic minorities may actually be good for liberal and democracy. So my colleague Jan Ravni at Sciences Po is writing a whole book about how actually the countries that aren't backsliding in post-communist Europe, the one you mentioned, are actually the ones with large ethnic 